By now you probably know, if you've been following along, that I've DNF'd seven of eight hundred milers, uh, but I'm not discouraged. I, I love the hundred milers so much, I'm, I'm coming back again. Uh, and I wouldn't think of not coming back again. I'm going for Zion in April. Um, but now I'm at the point where, you know, in the first episode we explored, uh, you know, my history of the 100 miler and where it's been challenging. The second one we did a tune up at Dead Horse by uh, Mad Moose Events in Moab and, you know, I had the time of my life running that 50 miler. But now I'm at the point where I'm, my, I'm, really working to increase volume, juggling family uh, and, you know, the flu going through the family and all that, st all that stuff has made it a little bit difficult to, to get the, the big block going, but, you know, I'm, I'm ramping up right now, but even more than that, like I've had eight times where I've ramped up, you know, a large volume block. Uh, this is, there's nothing new here. Yeah, I'm doing some strength training. I think that's going to be useful and helpful, of course. Uh, but what I haven't done is really just aggressively pursued people who I think are wise in the sport, who have multiple finishes under their belt, who have been to that moment in the race where they want to quit and they don't. And I've been there myself on a 50 miler, on you know a speed goat, 50k. You know we've all been there, but for some reason when I get to the 100 miler, I have issues, and so I am. I am reaching out to, to a lot of these people that I respect in the trail running community. Sure, they, some of them have some DNFs, of course, but they, they've, had, they've pushed through in some really hard races. And the first person that I, uh, I reached out to to join me uh, for this discussion was Elsa Jaworski. And Elsa has uh, got second place at the Tahoe 200. Uh, she just crushed it at the Coldwater Rumble down in Arizona. She's got the Cocodona 250 on her calendar. She's got the Buffalo 100 on her calendar. And I wanted to sit down and see how does she do it with a smile? Like a lot of these people that I've talked to are able to pull it off with a smile on their face. And I, uh, not only do I admire it, I envy it. Uh, I find myself jealous to also do it. And so when I sat down with Elsa, we talked through a, a wide array of things. Uh, and I was so inspired by it, we ended up releasing all of these as a podcast as well called the DFL Before DNF Podcast. Okay, so now now's where I get selfish. Like I, yep. I, I want to understand. Let's let's first start with Buffalo. Mm -hmm. This is your first time. Let's let's say you've made the first loop, so fifty miles. So yeah. So for context, for those who are listening, Buffalo is two fifty mile loops. Yeah. And uh, the first twenty miles is really interesting, and then the next thirty is really flat and long, even on the mountainside. Yeah. Yeah. And you, yeah. uh, it's very runnable. And during the day, it's very enjoyable by and large. And you get to the ranch and then you come back, you go around like the North end and then you come back and then you got to do it all over again. Yeah. So even before we get to like how crazy the 200 was, do you remember that like being at mile 50 at Buffalo, knowing that you're about to do all of what you just did again? Um, so I felt like as prepared, I think as one could feel to like know that my body could handle the mileage going into it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of like 70 to 80 mile weeks, I think for the most part. Um, nice. And honestly, the hardest part I think of Antelope was that like flat ranch out and back section. Cause it was like mid later part of the day, just hot, flat. Like there's no uphill yeah. or downhill to like reprieve your legs. Yeah. Um, and I was like struggling pretty hard at that point, but you know, still moving. Yeah. When I came back at 50, um, to head back out, I had an entire crew of like 15 people. My oh, friends had nice. come through yeah. and there's just, like boxes of pizza and you know, uh, I was like, okay, I've got, I've got a squad here to like help, th help that, me change. That does remind me part, part of your like vibe or ethos is party. Yeah. Like, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, like the dancing videos or whatever. Mm -hmm. So. I, get, I mean, talk to me about that. Is there anything practical about that? Or is that just like an expression for you? Is there, is there a part of you that knows like, hey, I'm going to be down. Can you guys make sure that you're there to do X, Y, Z? Yeah, yeah. So I think for me, the intention of doing all of these like music videos is <laughs> the, the, the concept of doing even a 50K, right, is ludicrous. This is yeah. a stupid idea to be running this far. Yeah. So if I'm going to be paying to suffer, I might as well have a fucking good time, yeah. right? And so a good way to keep that at the forefront of the mind is 
okay, what like, ridiculous music video can I make to, you know, you come through the aid station, the volunteers are stoked to be singing and dancing to something, yeah. um, you know, and so is your crew. It gives a chance for your crew to kind of interact with each other and be talking mm. about it. Yeah. Um, Cause sometimes they know each other, sometimes they don't. Right. So, and then for me too, it's like, okay, you know, it's something for me to zone out during the race. It's like, okay, well, I haven't filmed this one section. Mm. So like, let me think about what, what could I do for that? You know, yeah. a good way to kind of like distract <laughs> myself a little bit. Interesting. I mean, it's no secret if you're, if you're following Borderlands anyway, I mentioned Jeremy Cox a lot. He helped me, he brought me into the sport. I watched him run the Wasatch 100, uh, his first effort. And, and then we ran a lot of my uh, first attempt at Zion together. Uh, mentioned him a lot. He's the one who handed me Unbreakable on DVD, and I, I watched it, and, and just uh, I couldn't, I couldn't stop thinking about the hundred miler. And so I, I wanted to talk more, even though we'd done a documentary on him. I wanted to bring him in and just talk some more about that late race urge to quit. How does he keep going, like when his form is all gone and and things are hurting? Like there's a switch that some people have that I I uh, am looking for in myself. And so I wanted to talk to Jeremy about that in him. But so is there a moment in any of your 300 mile efforts where you th where you would have said, when I get to this next aid station, I'm gonna DNF? Um, I mean, I think I've, I think I've said it more as a expression of what I'm feeling rather than this is something I'm going to do. Yeah. I, I've never really said I'm going to quit. I've said I've wanted to quit. So even at Antelope, the very last aid station, yeah. I, you know, I'm like, Getting, I'm, I'm pretty down, tearing up a little, and yeah. I tearfully said to my wife, like, I don't want to finish. Right. And, um, you know, she's she's not the type to coddle. <laughs> so she says, you know, something like, yeah, you can quit. You just quit in five miles. Don't quit here. <laughs> yeah, quit, quit at the finish line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, who quits at the last aid station? Really? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure if you quit at the last aid station, there are really good reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's legit, legit reasons. That's, that'd be a hard one to recover from if you quit for bad reasons. So are you saying that you never legitimately entertain quitting? I mean, it's probably like, it's probably like if someone asks, do you ever think about getting divorced? Mm. You'd probably be like, I think about what it's like to not be married, but I'm not, I'm not going to take the action to yeah. do that. That's... Okay. I, I feel like it's similar. Wow. Yeah, everybody thinks about what if they, what if I got to the next aid station and they said, hey, you can't run anymore. I'd feel happy and relieved. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to cause that to happen. Yeah. I'm going to keep going. Yeah. And I think there's always, you know, I, I've never repeated a hundred miler. Yeah. This is my first year. I'm going to do Zion again. Yeah. This will be my first year doing one for a second time. Um, there, there's there's always a nagging uh, thing of like, well, I'd, if I quit now, I'd have to come back. Right. I mean, I think the other thing you should do is maybe maybe talk more shit beforehand, mm -hmm. so that like now you've got some ego in it too. Yeah. You know, you've been talking up your seven DNFs. Yes. What's what's eight of nine? If you know you yeah. you've already DNF seven of eight. Yeah. There's a there's a guy in um, Oregon who gave me that same advice. I think his name, his name is Ryan Cotton, I believe. And I said, what's your secret? He said, I talk a lot of shit before the race to where if yeah. I don't finish, it's, it's way worse than if I, uh, you know, than if I didn't talk the yeah. shit. I mean, I think there's something, there's something to that, right? You're yeah. creating the, the persona you want to be. And yeah. then now you've got to, you know, execute live up and live to up it. to it. It was fun to, to run with you at, dead horse this year we both kind of got back on the saddle and you had a longer time off than i did and you seem to have done a done a great job at yeah dead horse. but so here's here, here's something i think you should think about with dead horse because yeah. you had a you had a dog shit 30 miles yeah and then it all turned around at mile 34 or 36 woke up yeah yep. and so like you know like taking zion as an example not to sort of do too much woulda shoulda coulda on that yeah. one but like for all you know, it could have gotten great at mile 80. I know. Could have just and I think out. that's what you got to just keep reminding yourself whenever you feel bad. Like, yes. Yeah, so what? This too shall pass. 
Next up is Dylan Bowman. Uh, if you're into trail running at all, and, and like I've said, like I, though I celebrate the runner who struggles and, and doesn't, get, um, doesn't get on a podium, though I celebrate those runners, I am still an, an immense fan of the elite version of, of this sport. And there's no one that's been more, uh, lately, that's been pushing the sport out more uh, than Dylan Bowman, uh, of founder of Free Trail, co-founder of Free, Free Trail, and I wanted to talk to him as a runner, though, not as a co-founder of a, of a company that I enjoy. I wanted to see how he's, how he's done it. There's some documentaries about him at Hard Rock, but his 100-mile career started at the Leadville 100, and he got third in his first 100-mile attempt. And so I wanted to, to talk with him about, like, what's going on in his mind? How did he, when for the first time facing the 100-mile distance, not only did he finish, but he placed. And I'm super curious about the mind of an ultra runner who can accomplish that. And now I'm, I'm asking for advice. When you, you know, and, and the documentary is out there, so people can can go can go deep on your story in that. You're you're dark, it, you know. It's it's late race. There's carnage, and you decide to put another foot in front of another. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You get up and you go. How did you do that? Yeah. So things unraveled for me around mile sixty at Hard Rock at the Uray aid station going in the counterclockwise direction. Got really bad going over Virginia's Pass. Ended up recovering a little bit in Telluride, so this is roughly mile 72. And so I left Telluride, and at that point I knew my crew was not going to be coming to Chapman, the final crew checkpoint. So as I left Telluride, I sort of felt like, okay, you got to make it home now. You got to make it all the way around, even though things weren't going well. And then going up and over the top of Oscars Pass and down into Chapman, things really spiraled and got out of control. People started passing me right and left. I was like having to stop to gasp for air, bent over my poles, and my legs were fried, <clears throat> excuse me, et cetera. And so I ended up vocalizing my skepticism that I was going to be able to make it to my pacer, great guy, great athlete named Rich Lockwood. He was there, very supportive, trying to encourage me along. Ended up stumbling into the Chapman aid station and told the aid station captain there that I was quitting. I'm done. It's over. Yeah. And there was a film crew there to document it. Also told the film crew, hey, I'm out. I'm done. I just got to rest for a little while. The aid station captain there is a guy named Bill Shum, and he and I are now super close, and we're now actually combining forces on a new thing that we just announced to the free trail community that's going to try and mobilize the community around volunteer work based on our experience together. And basically, he babysat me at the Chapman aid station for two and a half hours. I was asleep for most of that time. They fed me coffee, they fed me donuts, and eventually it, it just became apparent that like, you can still make it, or at least you can try again to make it. And psychologically, I got to a point where it was like, okay, I at least have to try to make it. And if I get two miles out of this aid station, I can always come back and catch a ride back to Silverton but I at least need to give it one more shot. And I don't know where that resolve came from. Honestly, Josh, I think you can probably relate to this, but I had had this vision in my head for months because we have a now 16 month old son. He was just under a year at a year old at the time of Hard Rock 2023. And I had this vision in my head of like, obviously having the perfect day and carrying my son and kissing the rock is the symbolic. <laughs> finishing of my hard rock loop and I just couldn't get it out of my head I was like man I don't want my son to like his first race experience even though he'll never remember this to be his dad quitting at mile 82 you know like I still want to carry him to the rock and kiss it and that was really a thing that I think kept me going and eventually I was able to cover those final 18 miles big thanks to Rich my pacer for, for helping me out through that stretch I got a kick out of what Matt Johnson is doing on Instagram. Uh, he's popped up a lot in my feed and uh, I just love his intensity. Um, 
he's got a lot of energy. And so I actually went to Austin to, to meet him in person because I just wanted to, to chat more with him. So we met up at a park uh, there in, in downtown Austin, just off Congress, to talk about just kind of in a large scope who he is. And it's on the podcast now, but we wanted to hone in on Matt Johnson, the ultra runner. He, he DNF'd Leadville once, and then he went back and got Leadville. He, he, was, he worked for uh, Nick Bear at, at BPN for a number of years. He's not the average ultra runner. And so I wanted to get his take on uh, my world of ultra running and, and how does someone like him strength train and prepare for the late race struggle. Waking up and, cause it truly like I, I don't, I, I, there's, I'm not the best. I'm not even close to the best. Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even close to being close to those guys that are the best. Right. And I, and I don't know if I ever will be. Mm. But I sure the fuck will talk like I am. I will wake up and I will look in the mirror and I'll be like, "You son of a bitch, you are the best." <laughs> and and I'll tell everyone and I'll tell everyone that I'm the best. Like, yeah. and I and I, and I, because me speaking that out loud. Uh huh you hear it you know and the yeah. more like like here's the thing if you're growing up as a kid and your mom is sitting there and she's like fuck you fuck you fuck you fuck you what are you gonna think well fuck me you're right right, you know? right, right. and it but if your mom's there and she's like i love you 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 hmm. you're gonna feel loved yeah right so why don't we there's why don't we do that to ourselves people don't do that to themselves yeah to, right. to waking up and being like i'm the best i tell my friends that i'm the best i tell you know they i tell them that they're the best yeah you know hmm. words are so powerful and if I go around and I, you know, I, I show up to the to the start line of Rocky, and I'm like, yeah, I'm the greatest dude out here, and everyone's like, fuck that guy, and I'm like, yeah, fuck him, I don't care, <laughs> like, I'm the best, I'm the best, and then you know, you come in like 976th place, yeah, and then you're still walking to the finish line. He's like, I told you I was the best, <laughs> I told you what he was doing, and um, <laughs> and <laughs> learning. <laughs> That's great. That's not the trail. <laughs> that, but close to the welcome trip. Welcome to Austin, Texas. Like you have, however many 100s that you have DNF'd, would you say eight? Uh, seven? seven of eight. Yeah, you're like seven. Put some fucking respect on <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, give me some. So you've DNF'd seven yeah. 100s, but you've probably learned more oh my God. in those seven DNF's yeah. than I'm going to learn in the next four or five years. Right. Because I don't, I, I, I've, I've DNF'd twice. Right. And I learned so much from oh, so from much. Leadville, so much from Saddle to Surf. Yep. And you've done that what, almost four more times than I have. Yeah. I mean, the, and I'm the, thankful the for each of them. Ab I absolutely. And am. so, but when it comes down to okay, how do I how do I not? I like you're okay. Okay, I've learned enough. I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. I think it's carrying that that mentality of. What if? Just yeah. keep telling yourself, what if, what if, what if, what if? Mm. And that's good. What if I go one more mile? Yeah. What if I go one more mile? What if I go one more step? Yeah. You know, and break it, break it, break it down that's good. so much. Yeah. To where, like, you get to that point where you get, you, and you know the point where you're like, I'm like, like, I'm gonna quit. Yes. And yep. you're like, what if I go one more step? Jesse Rich was my uh, coach for a season. It just seems like in my life there was a period where all roads led to Jesse. My friend Tommy Green introduced me to Jesse. We both happened to be in Annecy, France on the same weekend in, a, in July of last year. He is a nutritionist and he's an elite performer. He's won the Wasatch 100. Uh, he's won the Snow Peak 50 miler. I have an immense respect for him, but he brings a, an, a, an angle on nutrition that is extremely accessible. And if I'm honest, I've not put a heavy emphasis on nutrition. So Jesse really took me to school in this interview uh, where we look at uh, that late race urge to quit as it compares to the food that we're eating. Your brain is super calorie intensive. It needs a lot of calories mm -hmm. to, to function properly. Yeah. If you're falling behind on your nutrition, especially in the later parts of it, 100, your brain's just going to tell you to quit. Like, yes. food is what's going to drive your yeah. brain. And, and a lot of people, which is totally normal, that's just how we are, it's, it's hard to eat for 100 miles. Yeah. No matter what product it, product it is, I'm working on it myself. I've gotten a lot better helping people get there too. Yeah. It's, it's not a perfect science. Like, it's yeah. hard. So one of the things I would advise to you is like, are you getting 
food every hour. Yeah, no. because because if your brain is starting to lack food, no matter how hard you train, that is going to be that's going to increase the 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 volume of that voice more and more. Of like I need to quit. Like your brain when it doesn't have energy and and nutrition, it's just going to tell you to quit Absolutely. more and more. And then yeah. you're already battling your body. You're having, and your body also needs those calories. Your body's tired, your mind's tired, and you're pretty much convinced that you can't finish. Yes. But it's amazing what some glucose can do to your system. Interesting. You get, you get calories into your brain and your muscles, mm -hmm. and everything can change. You know, I, I think for me, one of my struggles is, is to be externally motivated. Like, I'm internally motivated. And so there's a, sometimes nothing that someone can say on the outside hmm. when I'm in a funk. They can only push me further away. They can't bring me in. Like if they, you know, get really in my face, it's like I, I kind of, it's hard to shut down. But I think I, I, point being on that, for other runners who are out there that are like me in that, I'm hearing like the nutrition piece, which of course you got to have thousands of calories to get through 100 miles. Like that's so intuitive. But at the same time, there's been times where it's like, I haven't eaten in seven hours. I didn't even notice and so then I will come back with a plan like, oh, this is what I'm going to do every hour. And then it's like, this is disgusting. I don't want, it's not that my yeah. stomach is hurting, it's just I don't want to eat anymore. Yeah, flavor fatigue, yeah. yeah so and that's you, the thing, it's not intuitive. Like, at the yeah. beginning you can start eating. Yeah, you would think it would. Yeah. But then it's like you have to force your brain to say, let's get food. Yeah. Like, it's the weirdest thing. It's like your body wants to sabotage itself. Yes. Like, it's forcing this food down because... Yeah. It's you're just starting to get sick of the yeah. sweetness. You're starting to get sick of the foods, and we're just like running and eating is a hard thing for yeah. a human to do. Yeah, like it's it's there's resistance to yeah. that, and so training yourself takes years to yeah. be able to get on top of like this is what I need every hour. Yeah. You know, I met Michael Whiteside through Borderlands, and I really enjoyed hanging out with him. We had lunch one day at, at a Yoko Taco in downtown Salt Lake, where we just talked ultra running. Now we're around the same age, 41, 42 years old. Uh, but last year, uh, as a 41, 42-year-old guy, he did Wasatch 100 and Bear 100. And for those unfamiliar with those races, those are two beastly races in northern Utah. Wasatch being the second 100-miler ever in North America, uh, and Bear being a legacy race as well, though not quite as old. And they were three weeks apart, and Michael finished them both. And uh, he's got a day job, he's got a wife, he's a dad, and I wanted to see uh, how he did it. Because if you can imagine almost finishing the Wasatch 100, crazy impressive, but to know that when you cross the finish line, you've got three weeks until you tow the starting line of the Bear 100, I think there's a lot of wisdom to glean from how he did that. I vividly remember saying, this is gonna be the hardest thing I've ever done. Hmm. And I'm at you know mile 30. I thought, I'm going to have to dig deeper than anything I've ever done okay. before. This is going to suck. Like, I'm tired. I can't eat. Nothing looks good at an aid station. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was still drinking. I was still drinking. You know, yeah. they did gnarly, so I was still drinking, you know, calories Yeah. Um, at that point. But it was rough, man. All right. So, I mean, clearly we all understand the concept of digging deep. Right. But what everyone sort of unearths when they're digging is 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 unique. What as you're digging deep, like what are you finding in yourself? Right. A, what what's there that you can pull on? And B, did you surprise yourself? Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely surprised myself. Um, you know, I, I've I've learned over time with, you know, struggles and addiction and whatever else yeah. that I don't have an off switch. Mm -hmm. So once I start something, if I vocalize it. I'm not going to quit unless you make me. Mm -hmm. So either I'm going to miss the cutoff time, you're going to have to pull me, or I'm death marching and it's, you know, something real bad's happened. Yeah. So I didn't ever think that I was going to quit, um, but I didn't know how hard it was actually going to be. Mm. I mean, I expected the worst. Yeah. And I told myself relentlessly that it was awful. Yeah. And, um, and I was delusional about how good I was doing. I thought I was doing terrible the whole time. I mean, we got to, <laughs> we got to like, you know, the, I don't remember those aid stations, but anyway, it was right before the night. Okay. And uh, crew was there, yeah. stuck my head in the crate with all my stuff and was crying. But, you know, <laughs> and, and nobody really knew us because I was like laugh crying, you know, yeah. like that stood up and said, who said this was going to be easy? Which one of you said this was going to be easy? And they're like, you dummy. <laughs> 
I'm like, all right, so this is going to be hard. Yeah. But I was doing better than I did the first time I did bear at that hmm. point. And I was moving well. It just hurt. Huh. And I kept telling myself, your legs are not going to come back like a normal hundred. It's your legs are gone already. Like oh, Wasatch destroyed we're it. We're not bouncing back. Yeah. Anymore. Like you're not going to bounce so back. This is what life is going to be like. Yeah. It's going to suck. It's going to be really hard. On some levels, is that easier? I'm just thinking if I know that this is what I've got and there's no hope, this is like, so it's, it's to me, it's, it's Sisyphus. It's like, I'm never going to get the rock to the top of the hill. Right. I'm, it's never going to be there. So I got to learn to be happy with what I've got. Right. In some ways. Yeah, I think so. Your legs weren't coming back. Yeah. I mean, it was like, uh, there was no up going to happen, right? <laughs> yeah. I was just going to ride this low yeah. for the next 40, 50, 60 miles, whatever it was yeah. going to be, you know, I mean, and, uh, and come to grips with it, right? And that's, I think, was actually, you know, I tell myself is, is the stupid way to, you know, keep telling myself how hard it's going to be. But yeah. I was, in some ways, coming to grips with the reality that it's going to suck. Yeah. And it's not going to get better. Yeah. And, oh, well, like, what are you going to do, quit? <laughs> yeah, here we You go. know what I kept telling myself? Yeah. Like, so what are you going to do, give up? And I'm like, well, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Like, I'm just not. I, I wanted it so bad. Mm. Um, Why did you want it so bad? You know, multiple reasons some vain sure. like i told people i was doing it yeah i put it out there on social media yeah. i you know i put it out there and yeah. i didn't want to let people down so i you know the weight of everybody else's expectations mm. which didn't exist sure yeah no one's like, <laughs> like god mike's hey michael's got to do this yeah man if he it. fails oh, <laughs> no, what am sucks. i gonna do yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like you All know hope is lost yeah what's that guy yeah so i wanted it for that yeah and i knew that runners that i greatly respected couldn't do it yeah so i thought if i can do it man yeah that'd just be huge right i mean yeah. um so i just i wanted it so bad yeah and i knew there was no quit um but i was still terrified i mean did you know there was no quit because you didn't give yourself that door right Yep. So you were just like, there was no option. There's one way home and it's across the finish line. Right. I reached out to a handful of uh, elite runners that I, I really respect. And Anthony Casales said that he'd come and, and tell me a little bit about his uh, history and his existence in the sport. He got third at Western States. He got third at the Ultra Trail Cape Town. And I wanted to see how he does it with a smile on his face. The guy was smiling. He blames the camera angle but I think he was a legitimately happy runner, even at high mileage, 80, 90 miles. And I mean, I remember watching you run into the, the high school with a s smile on your face. I mean, of course, any, anyone's gonna be smiling, you know, when you can see the finish line. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the footage of you, you're smiling a lot, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, is that, is, that, is that smile, that late race ability to smile, is that happiness or is that a, what is that? <laughs> That's just the cameras being in the right spot at the yeah. right time is what it is. Nice. Um, yeah, I mean, probably a lot of the times, like, the cameras were there was, like, yeah. during, um, you know, your crew stations. And yeah. my crew was uh, my wife and then a lot of college buddies. Yeah, like, pretty much I remember co seeing that. College yeah. roommates. So, yeah. I mean, it's, like, a lot of people that I don't hang out with that much anymore. And yeah. people that probably make you laugh more than anybody. That's great. So. Yeah. When I watch, you know, your performance or other other great runners' performances, over, you know, over the course of the last year, Courtney obviously had, a you know, an all-time great year watching that and just thinking like it's just interesting to for the everyday runner just to like look and see like what is what can we glean because we look i mean what what where the venn diagram of anthony castellas and josh rosenthal like that crossover is probably just that we both love this <laughs> you know there's no way that you could do what you do if you didn't love it does that mean true true yeah i think especially i got that distance you definitely gotta love it i mean you've seen a lot of actually road people try to jump into it just because yes. they think it might be a new way to make money or keep a sponsor. Right. Or it, right. It's, they're on the back end of their road running career. Yeah. They kind of want to stay tapped into something running, yeah. running a sponsorship. And it, yeah, those days are almost it really, over. It really hasn't worked out that much. So there hasn't been that many road runners that have like had that approach that it's gone well for it. Yeah. Kind of more the people that have been road runners and kind of exited out early, it seems like, because yeah. they just, like the trail running in general and uh, yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah. But you've been able to hear, I mean, just this year, you pick up the Nike sponsorship, which is awesome. Great team. Mm. Clearly, you know, a good group of people. I mean, it, it, it seems like, you know, you look at guys like Rob Carr getting a first place at the age of 42 at Western States. Like, 
you've got a lot of good years in you and, and you've got a you know a family and, mm -hmm. and you've got a job here that you seem to like one of the things that's interesting about trail running is that even even the elite runners are juggling a lot yeah you know as you're i mean it's you're, becoming less and less yeah i feel like there is becoming more and more like the full-time yeah professionals that's not what i'm doing but um it is becoming less and less and that's just because there's more sponsorship dollars out there and yeah and um more just funding in yeah. general and yeah. it's it's interesting because it's you see a lot of people it is working and then some people it doesn't right so, right yeah it's definitely uh not for everybody yeah uh one thing that's missing i think in ultra trail running is discussions around mechanics maybe it's out there you know i think guys like sage Canada or uh, you know, others, maybe they'll talk mechanics. So I've come across videos on YouTube of mechanics, but uh, one thing that I think I'm missing, like is, is straight up discussion around running form. When I look at coaches across the spectrum, I don't even, I see coaches coming up with plans for volume blocks and, and, and how to strength train and, and how to eat. I haven't come across a ton of stuff uh, that is just about how how to run your form when you run so that when you get to mile 60 70 80 and 100 miler uh, you've got some tools in the tool belt on uh, knowing exactly what your upper body should be, look like and how your form should be and, and how to maintain it so how can i train in a way that sets me up for that late that late mileage uh, urge to quit once i started picking up my leg like you showed in the video i was like oh my gosh i can run further now with better form it's it's you know in my park runs is where i'm really focusing on it and now like that i've that i'm doing it it's like yeah, that's the strong that's a much stronger muscle and my muscles that go the quickest in ultras are always my hip flexors and so uh, this is where i get kind of selfish so first explain what i just said better <laughs> and second you know aside from really just about every post that you do being practically useful what sort of tips would you have for me, uh, you know, that would help me with my, with my running form that would help me survive, keep strength, run more efficiently, thinking up, you know, mile 60, 70, or 80. So first, correct yeah. me. <laughs> Explain that principle a little bit better about running with your hamstrings. Yeah, for sure. So a lot of people, when they run, um, they don't normally utilize their hamstrings because it's it's more of like a like a drag i don't want to say a drag but that's kind of like the best way to put it is people yeah. just kind of run through the motions but when you're actually utilizing your hamstrings you actually you can feel it when you're utilizing it um you're able yes. to kind of propel yourself a little forward more you know you have that energy mm -hmm. um and you're able to kind of take a take a bigger leap i guess you could say almost yeah. like a jump um yeah. and so when you do that it not only helps you take that that higher leap, but now you have more energy and you have more um, you're you're better in a better position to push down as well. So mm. and, and it's kind of like a sprinting thing. So when you're you know yeah. they always say you have to you know kind of hop like that um, and be quick mm. on your feet. But yeah. when when you actually focus on using your hamstrings, um, it's it's just a muscle that a lot of people like you said they have stronger hamstrings is is never really kind of think about it and mm. um it really just helps with your with your inner energy efficiency and um you know kind of allow you to to really just run more or run with a better form if mm. you will candace burt uh set the world record for the most consecutive ultra marathons in a row 200 days in a row she ran a 50k or longer um, finishing around May of, of last year, 2023. But before that, you know her as the founder of the Tahoe 200, and then Bigfoot 200, then the Moab 240, and now she's about to launch the Arizona Monster, uh, 309 miles across the uh, Arizona desert. When we talked, I wanted to see how she thinks about it, because for her, every day she's running an ultra marathon for 50 days, for her, the late race struggle is more like a late day struggle. How did how did she get through day one forty nine or day one fifty seven, day one ninety? When you definitely want to quit that late, and, and you've still got ten more days of running an ultra marathon every day, I'm super curious uh, how Candace thinks about that. 
It was tough. Um, there were there were days where one day I called up um, my friend Adam, who <laughs> was kind of my sounding board, like Garrett, on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. And um, I start, uh, I got he answers the phone, you know, and I go, uh, I just start bawling because my pelvis hurt really bad. I didn't know if I should keep going, mm-hmm. and my lips were horrible, um, just totally. Um, open sores you know um yeah. i'm thinking is it cancer like what's going on there's yeah. there's so many fears yeah. um that can come up and he goes um i'm in a car with a whole bunch of people right now let me call you back <laughs> and um and so i'm like still crying and i hang <laughs> up and i just i'm like okay you know what it's this it's just me like mm. I have these people I can call and all this, but I have to suck it up oh, and get yeah. it done. And I yeah. just sucked it up. And I think he called later. I was like, I'm okay now. <laughs> Everything's okay. <laughs> so I had yeah, to I just needed that one moment. Yeah. 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 I had to keep checking into like the moment I was in is everything mm-hmm. okay now instead yes. of going into the anxiety of, oh, um, gosh, that's great. The fear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what happens to us in ultras. It happens to us in life when we get caught up in, Oh my gosh, where is this going? Instead of being in that moment where everything is okay now. And if I stayed in the everything is actually okay right now, yeah. I could keep going. And that's just how it built on itself. It yeah. snowballed into something really big, but it started as something just really small. But I, I'm gonna keep this conversations alive. I desperately need the wisdom of these other runners who've done it if I'm gonna be able to finish in April at Zion. Uh, Tune into our podcast, DFL Before DNF, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and, and YouTube. Uh, I, if I, I think at this point, because of my experience, if I can tie my experience into everything that I've been learning from these other great runners, I think I'm going to be able to finish. I, I don't see a. Let me put it this way: if I don't finish, it's going to be because of an injury in the race that others advise me to quit. I feel like the tools that I'm being given is preparing me to to appropriately approach the starting line of the Zion 100 miler in April and setting me up for a finish. And so, you know, thinking back to what Matt said about showing up at the starting line and saying, you know, I'm the best. Uh, and then I finished the, the, I, I crossed the finish line in 900th place and I look at everybody and I say, I told you I'm the best. Like that level of confidence, that's something I've never had and that's something I'm trying to go into this with. So as I prepare to, to cross the finish line, not just tow the starting line, I think uh, I'm gonna keep these conversations alive leading up to that race and I hope that you'll tune in uh, and join me as we go forward in April.